Today is Tuesday, September 23rd, 2008. My name is Mark DePew. I'm the Director of Oral History for the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library. And it's my honor today to be able to interview Chuck Hartke about your experiences as a farmer and as a legislator and as the Director of the Department of Agriculture for the great state of Illinois. Welcome, Chuck. Well, thank you very much, Mark. I uh, always start with uh, some very straightforward questions. When and where are you, were you born? I was born here in Effingham County uh, on May 7, 1944. Were you born on the farm? No, I was born in the hospital, believe it or not. Uh, but some of my brothers and sisters were born on the farm. Okay. I'd like to, as much as possible, get a base of information about how your family arrived here in Illinois. Well, they came from uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, with a group of other settlers who, who came to the Tatopolis area. They wanted to uh, move west, and so uh, they formed the, um, um, a, a company, uh, around 25 or 30 families in Cincinnati, Ohio, and they sent all the money with uh, three of them, and they came across uh, on horseback. Uh, about what time frame would this be? Oh, probably in the um, um, 1830s, 1840s. Anyway, they they traveled uh, across the state of Illinois from St. Louis, uh, or no, from uh, Indianapolis, and they arrived in the Champaign area. The land was way too flat, too much water, and so uh, they came further south, and they went over to St. Elmo area, but the land over there just didn't suit the three guys, and so uh, the, the farmers, and so uh, they, they came back uh, east, and they found the area around Tatopolis to be suitable, and so they purchased the land in and around this area, several thousand acres, and then went back to Cincinnati, and all the families came uh, together in a wagon train, I guess, and, and settled in the Tatopolis area. Wow. Do you know if uh, any of these people would have come from uh, Kentucky or uh, that region before they went to Ohio? Because I know a lot of this area was settled by you know, what were Southerners at that time. Well, I don't know about that. I do know that uh, uh, most of my relatives and the people that settled in the Tatopolis area uh, came from Cincinnati, Ohio. Okay. Hartke, is that a yes. German name? That is a German name, yes. Okay. And Hunk, uh, the Hunk is the other half of, of the of the match between my mother and father. Do you have any idea of when uh, your ancestors would have come to the United States? Um, well, that's a question you probably should ask my sister Pat. I, uh, <laughs> She's the she, family she historian? She did the genealogy. She, she was the family historian, yeah. Okay. Well... 1830s is, is still a long way back. Do you, do you have a, a sense of the family through the generations up to the time that you came along? Well, I do know that uh, my dad came from the Bishop Creek area, which is south, about five or six miles here. And he came from a family of 14. And, and that your father's family, name? My father's name was Alphonse Hartke. He was the son of uh, Joe and Lena. Uh, Hartke, um, Lena and Joe had uh, 14 kids, like I said. Um, Which in those days was not unusual not at all. Not unusual at all, and they came from another uh, family of Joe Hartke prior to that. So that that's that's getting back here quite a ways. Mm -hmm. Now on my grandma or my mother's side, uh, she was an only child, uh, Sophia Hank. Uh, or Honk, uh, as she was known as, and um, um, English or German? Uh, German. Okay. Very much German. Um, anyway, uh, my grandpa, which I did not know, he died when I was a year and a half old. He died in 1945 in July. Um, he had relatives scattered around in you know, Littleville, which is a community right north here as well as South Dakota and Texas. So he had brothers that, that scattered uh, in, the, in the wind. I don't know why, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, Henry Hank was my grandpa. was the only one that stayed in this area. Um, and Uncle Ben and Aunt Josephine, who were in the Louisville area, but they had no children at all 
either. So, in this area of the country, was it uh, primarily Germans who settled the region? Yes. Uh, matter of fact, uh, during World War One, World War Two, uh, especially during World War One, there were a lot of a lot of concern about whether we were actually loyal Americans. Hmm. Uh, Catholics primarily or Lutherans? Mainly Catholic, uh, yes. Uh, uh, that's we talk about the Dutchtown War because the Lutherans were concerned from Aldermont when they saw several long pipes arrive on the train in uh, in the 1918 uh, and, and that time period because uh, I guess there was war rattling in Europe at the time and they were concerned that we were bringing in artillery pieces. <laughs> and actually, they were pipes for the organ at church. <laughs> Well, I'm curious. So, are some of these churches that uh, your your parents, your grandparents, going to speak in German in those churches? Oh, absolutely. As a matter of fact, at home, uh, Grandma and Mom and my dad, uh, mainly Dad, not not so much Dad, but Mom and Grandma spoke a lot of German at the table for us kids, so we wouldn't understand, especially at Christmas time and Easter and things like that. You know. They didn't want you to know what they were talking That's about. That's huh? right. They spoke, in, they spoke in German. They didn't argue with each other in German, did they? I never heard my parents argue at all. Well. Huh? Never. Very good. Well, tell us a little bit about growing up. You said it was 1944 when you were born? I was born in 1944. You had a few brothers and sisters? Uh, yeah, I have uh, uh, five sisters, four brothers. It's a family of ten, ten of us. And I was number seven. Um, Mom and Dad had... Uh, Four girls first, uh, Mary Lou, Margie, Mary, Sally, and then uh, Jerry This came is not out. what uh, is supposed to happen in a farm family, is no, it? No, no. And so uh, when Jerry was born, uh, the word is, uh, so uh, I'm told by some of my uncles uh, that uh, Dad went out and he really put on a good bender He uh, uh, because uh, Mom had finally found the right pattern and, and Jerry was born. And, uh, and then... Uh, he went out and bought a farm, by the way, too. And um, and then Pat came along, and Dad went and got on a good bender again because Mom lost the pattern. I don't know why, but... Um, Pat being a girl. Pat being a girl. And so uh, then in 1944, I was born. And he went and got drunk again and bought another farm. <laughs> Mom got it right, finally. And so there were seven of us then, and then there were three boys following. Well, when you Pride say... Filming, Mike. He went out and bought a farm. You know, it's kind of... you just casually throwing that phrase out. It was just like an 80-acre 80, 80 farm? Yeah. Uh, an 80 acre farm, or uh, in some cases, a complete farm. I know we bought the Westendorf Place, which didn't have a house on it. What was the name again? The Westendorf Place, and which is uh, that was 114 acres. Um, and then he bought the uh, Funkhauser Farm, which was an area west of Effingham. Um, and then he bought the Piles Farm, which is this farm. Uh, which was a whole farm, mm -hmm. 235 acres. And then he bought one south of Effingham, and I forget what we call that, but that was a, another farm. So he bought the whole farms. That well, had about 2,000 acres at one time. Wow. A lot of this farm purchasing was happening, if you came along in 44 and he bought a farm then, your brother came along a few years earlier, um, Obviously, not during the height of the Depression, I would think. It was during the, the Second World War when prices were up a little bit? Yes, and uh, Dad did not go to the military because I don't know why. I know all of his brothers did. Uh, but being a farmer, that's an essential industry. Too. Right, and so maybe, maybe because he was involved in farming with uh, Grandpa, that, that he did not go, but I know Uncle Lenny, Uncle Joe, Uncle Irby, um, all did go. Uncle Clarence, uh, mm. they, they all went to the military. Were they farming as well? If so, they were farming with their uh, with their dad, maybe just as a hired hand at, on, on okay. the farm. I'm, I'm not sure. But I know that they all eventually uh, farmed from the Hartke farm in, in the Bishop Creek area. Uh, Uncle Roman was the oldest. I don't remember him. Um, stories about him anyway mm -hmm. being being in the military. Well, once your parents were done having children, how many are there? Uh, there are ten of us. And what was it like growing up in a big family on a farm? Oh, uh, you learned to share a lot. and learned to have a lot of patience. Um, you did a lot of hard work. 
It was uh, a lot of togetherness, I can tell you that. Um, early on, uh, Mom and Dad wanted a big family, and they knew that, and the house they were living in with Grandpa and Grandma was not going to be big enough, and so they bought a another farm house, which was uh, a mile across the section. And uh, I wish I had pictures of it. I know we do, can't find them, of a steam engine pulling this house uh, across the field and pulling it right up next to the original house that was on the family farm. Pulled it about 10 to 12 feet as close as they can get it. And so then Dad put a bathroom between, as a hallway between the two <laughs> houses. And the one house upstairs had three bedrooms, and that's the one they pulled across the section. And that was the girls' dorm. And The house uh, that had been pulled all over. Right, right. That, that it was just pulled on a foundation. They didn't put a basement on I think they should have, but they didn't. Um, but uh, they put a, ba a bathroom between the two houses, then the boys' dorm of course, was above the dining room and another big living room and the kitchen. That was a main stave. And, uh, the dining room was huge because we had not only the 10 kids, mom and dad, grandma, that was, because grandpa had passed away in 44 or 45, and then uh, a hired hen. We always had a hired hen that, that lived with us. So there were 14 around the dining room table. Every night? Every night, every day. Uh, it was... Uh, it was quite an experience. It really was. How old were you when uh, they put these two houses together? Uh, I probably was maybe one. I don't know. or maybe It was moving the steam engine. Okay. Uh, or maybe it was done before that. I, I don't remember. I see remember pictures of, of, of this uh, team of people, uh, team, uh, 10, 12 guys in the steam engine and the rollers they used. and the, the Yeah, that's quite an operation. Oh, man, yeah. I would. I don't know if I want to try to move a two-story house today, you know, across, diagonally across the section, getting mm -hmm. all the neighbors to agree. And, and there was one creek they had to cross and keep it together, uh, you know. Um. Did either of these houses have indoor plumbing before they did this? No, uh, neither one did, and so. Uh, so that's another reason for doing this major renovation. Well, <laughs> I don't know if that was or not, but uh, I do know that uh, I remember having an outhouse, and the boys. That's what we got to use uh, the outhouse and. The, Even with this brand new bathroom, you had to. use Well, the yeah, because you know it's a pretty, pretty complicated place. You know, in the morning. Uh, everybody trying to use this thing, and especially the girls. The girls were pampered, I guess you might say, and they got to use the indoor plumbing in this. Guys had to use it outside. So, so your dad said it's more important for the young ladies who are probably getting up into junior high and high school to have right, the right. option of using that indoor bathroom. Huh? Right. Well, plus the fact that uh, the dad milked cattle, and and the girls were out there helping uh, with the milking in the morning. Uh, the younger, uh, younger guys, I guess you'd say Jerry and Frank and I and and uh, Pat. Pat didn't see a whole lot of the milking being done, but uh, um, yeah, the, the girls got to use the indoor facilities. Well, tell me about the chores, especially the chores you got to do early in the morning, maybe. My early morning chores, since I was one of the littler guys, when we had the dairy, uh, the dairy cattle, I climbed the silo and uh, shoveled the uh, silage out uh, for some 25 or 30 dairy cattle, which we had usually, you know, the, the heifers and the bull and, and whatever. But uh, I got scoops of silage out or forked the silage out down the chute and then uh, deliver it with a wheelbarrow to the, uh, to the cattle to be fed. Also fed a lot of hay, and then while the milking cows were in their stanchions, I did the, uh, a lot of bedding, uh, Brother Frank and I. Crawl up in the loft, you know, get two bales of straw down and uh, maybe two bales of hay in the bunk. I forget the, what exact amount, but but uh, that was some of, some of my chores, uh, everyday chores. Um, Brother Frank, I know, was uh, relegated to the chicken house and picking up the eggs, and he did not want to be a farmer after that experience. <laughs> so, okay. That's fine. Oh, how about the girls? Did they get their share of chores? Uh, they did. Uh, of course, they were older and with a, a dairy operation, and we had some beef cattle. Uh, there was lots of baling 
that had to be done, and they get to do that. Uh, usually two of the girls, I would say Margie, and Mary Lou, I'm not sure about, but Margie and uh, Sally did a lot of the, uh, um, a lot of the milking. Uh, and putting together the milkers was, a, was a, a good task. I think Pat did a lot of that. That was one of the things she's first up out to the barn, put the milkers together. And Were these mechanical milkers? Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, I just was at a, a, a family wedding this Saturday and was talking to my sister Marge. And I talked about De La Valve, and I mentioned that a couple of times, and she called me this week and says, no, 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 it wasn't De La Valve junk, it was Surge. We had Surge equipment, and we bought it from Pals Dairy Equipment in Effingham. Well, I, I'm afraid you're going to have to explain De La Valve to me. De La Valve is a brand name like Surge, Milkers. Okay. okay. So, uh, was this fairly... Uh, Recent uh, innovation on the farms in this region that you'd have the mechanical milkers. Oh, I'm I'm sure my dad was uh, and grandpa in particular were innovators. Uh, um, everybody liked to work for my uh, grandpa because one of the things that he did do was uh, for the young men that worked for him, the high school kids. Uh, he would uh, pile them all in some kind of automobile and make a long trip to Springfield, Illinois. To go to the state fair, and you can see everything at the state fair. And so, uh, if you work for Henry Hank, you got a trip, one day trip, to the state fair. And that's where they see all the new innovative farm new innovative uh, farm equipment and discs and plows and tractors and anything that's possible. And so, um, my grandfather was determined that uh, uh, we were going to have the best uh, when electricity came around in this part of the country. Uh, this road going past here was CIPS, um, Central Illinois Public Service Company. Mm -hmm. but we live a mile over, and those farmers that had electricity on this road, that's fine, but they weren't going to serve everybody. And that was before we had REA, Rural Electric. Uh, this was in the early 30s then, maybe? Right. The, the, the cities had electricity, but the rural country didn't, unless you were along the line. Uh, Grandpa built a line between here and his place, one mile, poles and everything else, and paid for it so that we would have electricity and, and electric motors and things. So. so modern in terms of the days. Modern, yes. Dad, or Grandpa, I think, was the innovator in doing those things. Well, once you got done with the chores, I suspect you headed off to school, right? Headed off to school. Plain tree. I spent uh, five years uh, in a one-room schoolhouse. I, I joke, say first grade was really tough, you know. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, no, and I, I spent first, second, third, fourth, fifth grade uh, at Plain Tree School, and there were 28 kids that I recall from the various families around. This was a public school, one-room schoolhouse, taught by Teresa Hoffman, and um, Elvira, Sally, Jerry, Pat and myself, Sally, very Sally, Jerry, Pat, and me. There were five of us of the 28. They were Hartkeys. So. Well, I would guess that there were some other families that uh, had more than one kid going to school, too. Oh, absolutely. It was, uh, there were about five family names in the whole school, or six, you know. And Do you think you got a good education there? Well, I don't know. I, I think so. Uh, I think it taught, uh, you understand, uh, a one-room schoolhouse with one teacher, there was not time for six hours of class for the second grade or the first grade. Frankie Wolf and I just could not absorb that much all day, you know. <laughs> and so you learned uh, responsibility. You learned to do tasks by yourself. Um, math was taught. Um uh, the basic counting and multiplication and addition and subtraction and division. And so Teresa would give us a workbook that maybe had a hundred additional addition problems in. And so you sit down and you did it on your own and she was busy teaching geography. Now, if you got done with those uh, problems, 
she didn't have time to see if I added 128 and 692 and 444 and got the right answer. She would hand it to my sister, Sally. <laughs> and Sally then, of course, would have to add them up and check those to see if I did it correctly. And if not, Sally helped Chuck get his addition or division correct. And uh, geography. Um, she'd pull down a map and she'd be teaching the fifth grade geography. And of course, you know, your mind wanders once in a while and you're paying attention. And she would ask, now, just exactly where is the Sahara Desert? Talking to the fifth grade class. You raise your hand. Oh, well, you, well <laughs> Chuck, you know the answer, but I'm talking to the fifth grade, you know. So you, you would daydream a little bit, but it was it was it was always. I think yes, it was a it was a good education. It really was. And I would guess by the time you're in fourth or fifth grade, the expectation is on you to help the smaller kids. Too. Absolutely. Um, when we finished school at three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, the bigger boys went and got the brooms and mops, and we mopped the floor, and the little guys were. Uh, you know, with a little dustpan, and we, mm -hmm. we picked it up and threw the stuff outside, and two of the boys went out to the coal bin, and they got coal for the next morning. Uh, one of the girls got a two-gallon pail of water and went out to the pump and pumped them, uh, some water and so forth. So, uh, How far was it from your house to school? Uh, well, you've heard these stories. It was, it <laughs> well, was, see, I'm uh, giving you the it opportunity. It was two miles uphill, both way, and two, three drift, foot drifts of snow, you know, to and from. It was always uphill to school. Actually, I had two miles. Two miles. It was two miles. And uh, how'd you get to school? Uh, rode a bike uh, or walked. Uh, walked across the, uh, uh, across the field most of the time. Well, that's another place where the, the older girls would have come in handy because I suspect they were in charge of getting all of the, the, the siblings to school, weren't they? Uh, yes, uh, and, and we had a whole fleet of bicycles having 10 kids, you know. and uh, uh, But it didn't, it didn't really take that long. Now, when, when it was raining or really snowing hard or things like that, uh, Dad may have made have taken us a time or two and... and uh, in a car and pick it up the neighbors and they would mm -hmm. call uh, of course it was a community line you know 21F31 and everybody picked up when you rang extremely long or whatever you say well I'm, I'm driving today I'll pick up your kids and we'll get them to school and, and the same thing when it, it was really nasty raining well then we'd all be picked up and uh, and, and brought home and so where'd you go to school then after that uh, consolidated into Chautauplas uh, grade school, uh, Maple Grove and uh, Plain Tree and a couple other small schools all were consolidated into Teutopolis grade school and that took place in, oh, 56 or 57. Did you uh, get bus there then? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, buses started running throughout the entire area at that time. Tell us a little bit about the religious foundation that your parents were given the kids? Um, of course, this is all a Catholic community, and of course, we uh, uh, we were born and raised and baptized and so forth here in the Catholic Church here in St. Francis uh, Parish in, in Teutopolis. Although this was a public school and public tax dollars, uh, and the grade school, particularly, uh, were taught by Catholic nuns. It was a public school. The, the Catholic nuns were, were our teachers. We never had priests to be teachers. But the bus system would run about um, an hour early. School started at 8.30. We were there at 7.30. And we had catechism for an hour. Oh, okay. I was going to say, you can get in a lot of trouble. Or we went to Mass uh, at the church in the morning and then traipsed over to the grade school, which was actually uh, today yet the parish owns the grade school. Today yet. Hmm. Uh, and we lease it to the public unit 
for school. Only. <laughs> uh, tell me a little bit about the holidays for the family. Oh, holidays. Actually, weekends, um, uh, it's such a big family and, and brothers and sisters on the Hartke side, at least. We had a lot of company on weekends, and uh, holidays were uh, generally chores. Dad did not work on Sundays or holidays, and so uh, those were always times when he uh, had a time to um, to take a nap and just, just relax and so forth. I do know that uh, uh, one of the reasons I don't have chickens today and just hated chickens because that was one of my jobs as an early, uh, early in childhood, uh, five, six years old. Grandma would instruct uh, little Chuck uh, to uh, get a pail of water and a broom and um, clean the chicken manure off of the sidewalk so that when people came on Sunday, they didn't have to step on the chicken manure. So, um, we so every a, weekend you're out there cleaning oh, the yeah, sidewalk. scrubbing the sidewalk off. It was good training. <laughs> it really was. You should try to train the chickens to... Keep off the sidewalk. Well, yeah, that that was a good. We tried to do that as as well. We had a two yards. We had the barnyard, and then we had the house yard, and there was a four foot fence, you know, uh, between the two, and of course flowers on the inside of the uh, uh, house yard, and weeds on the outside. I guess I don't know, but anyway, uh, the barnyard. The only thing that was out in the barnyard were the chickens. And they would occasionally somehow manage to fly across and get into the house yard and on the sidewalks. And, mm -hmm. and believe you me, uh, we had many emergency chicken dinners because I got <laughs> frustrated at those chickens. You know, I guess I forgot to ask you earlier, describe the farm that you grew up on. Uh, usually 18, 20 milk cows, uh, uh, maybe 15 or 20 beef cattle. Uh, I raised a calf and we sold either the steers or, or finished them out. We had maybe eight or ten uh, uh, brood sows and, and a boar, uh, usually 300 laying hens, um, which meant that we had uh, 300 uh, um, broilers that we fed out and usually mid-July we were, we were butchering chickens. Um, it was... Uh, it was a typical farm. We had three hucksters that, that came uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday uh, to stop by bringing cereal or bread, and we'd sell the eggs and and so forth. We uh, sold uh, milk, I believe, to Peebley Dairy for a while, and then it was Prairie Farms um, that, that actually bought our milk, and they were there, I think, every day or every other day and picked up the milk in milk cans. We had... Um, I don't know, four or five, uh, 10 gallons of milk that were picked up. Uh, of course, the uh, milk cooler was the greatest place to put a watermelon to keep it cold. <laughs> well, it sounds like, uh, you know, from stories I've heard from others as well, that uh, it was the egg and the milk money that was kind of the household money that you could rely on a regular basis. Well, Grandma did a lot of trading. Of course, we had an old cluck in once in a while that wouldn't land, and you know, we'd, we'd sell an ant or two. Mm -hmm. We'd sell, I don't know, maybe two cases of eggs uh, every other huck or every other day, uh, something like that. Two cases of eggs would be, what, uh, 36 dozen? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't do the math on this, but then anyway, we had. Uh, we had about 300 chickens, I know, and we sold a lot of a uh, lot of eggs to the, and it was traded. You know, case eggs uh, was worth so much, and uh, with a big family, you bought a lot of cereal and oatmeal and rice and flour. I, I do know that uh, mother was very good with a sewing machine, and uh, growing up, uh, she made shirts for uh, my brothers and I out of the flour sacks. I can tell you that. Uh, I got tired of looking like my brother Frank. But, you know, we <laughs> well, I knew at that time, though, the the flower sacks were designed so that the farmers could use them for that yes, purpose. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, they had a pattern on them, and mm -hmm. so that's that's what they were you know, for. Big garden? We had a huge garden. I would say probably uh, an acre, maybe an acre and a half of, of strictly vegetables. We had uh, 
two or three cherry trees. We had uh, three or four apple trees, two plum trees. Um, we had a lot of raspberries. We did not have tame blackberries, but we picked an awful lot of wild uh, blackberries in the Lillaville area and Uncle Ben's uh, woods and, and farm. Uh, tomatoes, peas, cabbage, um, canned a lot of uh, green beans and sweet corn and, and uh, peaches. Uh, peaches we usually bought. Uh, we had a white peach tree, or, or white peaches, but um, they were always wormy. I don't know why, but uh, they were good, but uh, we, mm -hmm. they, were not, they were not like the uh, peaches we bought uh, at Frina. We took the big old Buick and went to Frina to get three or four bushels of apples. But what you're describing here, Chuck, is uh, pretty close to a self-sufficient family system. Yeah, I think so. I, I think uh, I mean there were certain things that we did we did buy sugar and the flour and the coffee and and those things, which is typical, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, well, it cost a lot of money to to maintain a family of of ten kids and hired in and uh, yeah. Do you remember anything special about either Christmas or Thanksgiving celebrations? Uh, Thanksgiving, not particularly so, but Christmas uh, was was always a, a big event. And uh, uh, turkeys, mm, occasionally we would have a turkey, but uh, the dad would buy in town. Uh, but uh, we usually had ham, and that, uh, of course, being a uh, uh, Raising, raising the hogs and so forth, that was natural, I guess. Slaughtered your own hogs. Oh, yeah. We slaughtered probably three hogs every winter, maybe four, and uh, at least one steer, and did the butchering ourselves. And Right here on the farm. Right, right on the farm. Oh, yeah. Uh, got into all that, and, and uh, of course, the uh, uh, back fat on the hog was like an inch and a half or two inches, and... Uh, you cut it up into little cubes and you boil the fat out or, or cooked it up and press the mm -hmm. lard and put the lard in buckets and that's what was used to make uh, uh, the crust and peri cherry pies and everything else that we had. <laughs> yeah, so, so what are we all hungry but, now. Uh, well, anyway, yeah. It, it, um, um, but that's to say, to a certain respect, the hogs were a lot different then than they are now. They're new weren't nearly as lean as the hogs would be today, are they? Oh, no, 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 they, they were not because they didn't have to be because you needed the lard anyway mm -hmm. and the grease and the, a lot of things. Were, we made soap, live soap out of, uh, out of the lard as well. And so uh, we used everything but the squeal uh, from that hog and, and it's the honest to God true. Even the cracklings that were the, 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 where the fat was fried out of the, the things, uh, uh, that was used as dog food. Uh, for the, for the dogs, made your own sausage, absolutely. Uh, blood sausage as well. No head cheese. Uh, I don't know if you know what that is. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, okay. We made the we made the head cheese and the blood sausage. Um, uh, that was considered a delicacy by some people, but me, I went crazy about <laughs> it. But. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about school, and I'm wondering about the Harky. Uh, kids in school, were you able to do some of the extracurricular activities? Actually, uh, grade school, uh, not until I got to the 5th, 6th, 7th grade, 6th, 7th grade, well then we we did play uh, basketball um, and of course we, as country kids, we we were uh, allowed to join the Little League in Tentopolis and we played baseball, of course. Um, I also uh, played in the band in, in grade school and high school. Started uh, uh, out with the trumpet in my sixth grade, I guess. Uh, switched to a baritone and then wound up playing the trombone all through high school in a dance band in the state FFA band. So. In high school, and started thinking about, okay, I'm going to graduate here eventually. Uh, what were your thoughts about what your future would be? Um, well, I always wanted to be a farmer, and um, was so, that the expectation of your parents as well? It was the expectation, I think so. Yeah, and so I excelled in uh, agri 
Agriculture classes, FFA, Future Farmers of America, 4-H. We uh, we showed a lot of uh, hogs and cattle at the county fair. Never showed it to state fair. Uh, county fair and the FFA fair. And we had some pretty good registered Chester Whites uh, and did a good job. Picked up a lot of hardware and trophies at the county fair and the FFA fair. But why not the state fair? You just never made the cut? Um, I don't know. We just, uh, we were never allowed to go to take our animals to the state fair. By your parents? Um, Alamont Fair was questionable because that was a long time. There were a lot of Lutheran girls that were very tempting over there. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Certainly never, that would never factor into it, I never, would think. I, I don't know. Okay. So what did you do after you graduated? When did you graduate from high school? I graduated in uh, May of 1962. Okay. I uh, was uh, madly in love with a little gal by the name of Kathy. High and, school sweethearts. Mm -hmm. What was Kathy's last name? Haney, H-O-E-N-E. -E. Another good German name. Another right? good German name, Derryman's daughter. And so uh, we dated uh, our senior year in... Uh, then she went to Fontbonne College that fall in St. Louis, a small girls' school. And uh, I gave her a diamond around Thanksgiving, I guess, or sometime in there. And we became engaged, and August the 10th of 1963, we got married. So a year moved, out of high school. And moved into this house. Okay, I think we probably want to take a break. I think uh, so, too. I think we lost some light. <laughs> yeah, you sure did. We took a quick break there for technical reasons, Chuck, but uh, I believe we got you through pretty much your high school years. You're a brand-new young married man. Mm -hmm. um, now you got some other responsibilities to worry about. Hey, Kathy and I started here on uh, August 10th in a new home we built and planned uh, during... All spring and summer, we got married in August, and got back from my honeymoon from Idaho, visited relatives out there, I have relatives in Idaho, and she does too, and so we we got home here uh, at the end of August and settled in uh, our uh, new home on the farmstead, lots of old buildings around outside, and we decided uh, we were going to live here together for the rest of our lives. Right where we're sitting right, right now. Right where we're sitting here right now in this same same living room. And uh, Was this uh, land that you owned at the time? Uh, I told you earlier that, that Dad kept buying farms and so forth, and then uh, he, he had too much land they knew what to do with, so he started giving land away, and he gave uh, his daughters and sons a piece of property when they got married. And so uh, I received, each one of the ten kids. Yes. So I received this eighty acres as a wedding gift, and uh, not bad. That's a great wedding <laughs> gift. Transfer uh, the title, the whole works. Yes. Uh, and um, of course, you could do that with you know the the gift tax and and mm -hmm. legally and and so he did. Uh, we received this eighty acres as as a wedding gift, and uh, so I started farming it. Bought a uh, that spring, before I got married, bought a uh, uh, used Super Am and a four-row John Deere planter and and uh, uh, got the crops in with a little of nothing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had, had a good good harvest that year and, and brought my hog operation from FFA, which I had, uh, let me see, 12 sows, six gilts, and a boar, brought them over here. And I started raising feeder pigs and uh, sold those to my dad and my brother Jerry, who lived at another farm in Island Grove. And um, the first year that we were married, the uh, first full year, I raised a 1,000 feeder pigs, uh, expanding my operation, you know, the gilts and so forth. Mm -hmm. First full year. And uh, What was the time to market for those pigs? Oh, uh, eight weeks. Uh, for feeder pigs, I just raised them to thirty-five, forty pounds, mm -hmm. and, and then would sell the feeder pigs. Uh, let somebody else finish them off. Let, yeah, because I didn't have the finishing floor and capability of of doing that at all. And um, when you uh, when your father 
gave you the 80 acres, and you said you came here. Was there already a house and some outbuildings here? There was a, an old barn. There was a block chicken house over here. There was a, a, a little garage. There was an old house. It was built in, uh, I don't know when, uh, probably the early 1900s. So the, these things were vacant at the time you came here? Well, no. Dad always rented this farm uh, to either, well, Uncle Leonard lived here, Uncle Irby lived here, uh, Cousin Joe lived here, Leroy, um, Leroy Ordner lived here, Lenny Shoemaker lived here. Uh, this was a starter farm for a lot of them because all these guys that, that I mentioned left here after two or three years and bought their own farm either in this community or in yoga or north of uh, town here. Or north of, This was a starter farm, farm I guess. And so uh, John Ferdy, who, who lived next door, was lived here uh, for a short period of time. And he went and bought his own farm. Um, this, uh, so we we tore the house down, built a new house. This this is going to be my when when did that happen? In uh, 1963. Okay, so right after you got here. When I knew this was going to be my farm, uh, six months before I got married, we tore the old house down and started building. A new house. So you started right with, I would assume you had to take out a loan to, to build the new house. No. Uh -huh. There's another story. <laughs> <laughs> My grandfather was an entrepreneur. Uh, he bought a, uh, a car dealership uh, during the Depression in Effingham in a warehouse. Anyway, uh, he, he went out of the business of selling cars and then leased the warehouse to a beer distributor, and the beer distributor <laughs> paid rent that he didn't want the money, and so he said, "I want to put the money into a trust for my ten or my grandchildren." He didn't know how many he had yet, and so uh, he died in 1945, and there were seven of us then, and so from 1945 until 1963, all the money was a rent on this warehouse was put into a trust fund divided ten ways equally between my brothers and sisters, that trust fund. When I got married, um, uh, through savings bonds and whatever else they did uh, in that trust fund, uh, put a $21,000 savings bonds to Charles A. Hartke. I cashed the savings bonds and built this house. This is a $21,000 home in 1963. Well, the family was very generous. Very hard generous. Hard-working Germans. Yeah, hard-working Germans, and I didn't know I was wealthy until uh, uh, I, I never have been wealthy. I just. <laughs> but you've always been comfortable. Always, well, I've always worked very hard. Yeah. Uh, following year, Kathy and I bought... Um, 155 acres uh, from my sisters who had part of a deed of 155 acres that dad gave them. Mm -hmm. And so I bought it from them. And started to build your own farm up from there. Uh, to, and then I had 235 acres. And then a couple of years later, I bought a 40 that was with mom and dad they wanted to sell it they sold another 40 to my brother phil and i got the next next 40. and then i got looking around and now um, i guess 1972 i bought uh, uh what's called the jansen farm which is uh, uh 140 some acres uh, east of us which no hard kid ever owned before uh, and then i and a couple of years later i bought um, part of my brother's farm, 160 acres, my brother Jerry's farm, who wanted to sell. And uh, I bought that and rented the rest. And then I rented 114 acres of the Westendorf place. Uh, <laughs> I rented that. And then my neighbor walked over a couple of years later. John Ferdy said he wanted to quit farming. And I bought his hundred and. 100 acres next door and 85 acres in Clay County. So I wound up with about 1,000 acres. 
and you have the thousand acres by what year would you say oh 92 93 okay. so i want to jump way back again okay. and talk about your experiences in the army because oh yeah you were well, a young man we at the time when there was a draft there was a draft and then in the, in 1966 I mean, because I had been married three years and we didn't have any children, and uh, the draft back then they were they were going to those guys that weren't going to college and single and whatever, and so there was a pecking order, and if boy you got out of high school in 1966, you went to college, buddy, because that gets you deferred, so you wouldn't have to go to Vietnam. You had good grades because if you flunked out of college, you were going to wind up in in the army uh within two months you know and so well i'd been married and no problem and and uh had set my ready for life and i was 21 22 years old and and um i didn't have any kids and by golly all of a sudden one day they ran out of these single guys that <laughs> weren't going to college and whatever and so this is this is a time when vietnam, vietnam build up was occurring build up was occurring and so um in about July, uh, I, uh, late August, I received a notice from the United States uh, Army saying that uh, my friends and neighbors had chosen me to serve their my country, and so uh, I, I crops I had to get out. So I simply went to the draft board, and um, Brother Jerry, who had no kids either, we both got our draft notice the same day, uh, and so. Uh, we were asked to uh, we asked to have 90 day deferment to get our crops out. So, December the fifth um, or December the sixth, 1966, I left for the United States Army, St. Louis, Missouri, uh, Fort Leonard Wood. Took a battery of tests, went to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, for my um, basic training. From there, went to Fort Sam Houston, Texas, um, in San Antonio, for my AIT. I became a medic. Uh, and so, is that uh, something you had selected? No. Uh, the Army just, selected that for you? They said I knew how to give uh, hog shots. I can give uh, private shots, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, What had you preferred to do? If you'd had a choice in the kind of specialty, what would it have been? Oh, I don't know. You know, I, I, uh, I didn't want to be an infantryman, you know, so... Uh, well, Fort Leonard Wood at the time was uh, the location where engineers were being training. Right. Um, that'd have been fine, but uh, I just took a battery test, and you know, you really don't have a choice when you're drafted. Here's, here's where you go. Two years, right? Two years, right? And they kept uh, wanting me to be uh, become an officer, uh, go to OCS, Officer Training School. Sign up one more year, and you can become an officer. Well, I knew back then in Vietnam, second lieutenants were shot every other day over there just for the hell of it, you know, so so I did not want to be an officer. I wanted the only thing the only thing I really wanted out of the army was out. <laughs> well I'd been a my own boss for uh, three years, independent farmer, and the last thing I want to do is be told when to get up, when to go to bed, when to work. And I tried to tell him I was not leadership quality. I did not want to be any kind of decision making position. I just didn't have it in me. I'm not a leader. I'm a follower, you know, I don't want to do this. I'm not going to be an officer. But they obviously saw something in you. They well, must have. I don't know. But anyway, they made a medic out of me, and, and um, I spent uh, some time in Vietnam uh, as a senior medic working in a mobile army surgical hospital. Uh, were you assigned to a division? Yes. 5th Infantry Division mechanized. That's the big red one. Uh, 5,000 men. 1st Infantry Division. Pardon? Did you say 1st or 5th? 5th. 5th Infantry Division Mechanized. Okay. Okay. Well, you said Big Red red One. I threw Big Red off. Diamond. Big Red Diamond. Okay. I'm glad I clarified that. Yeah. Uh, did the division go over together? Division went together. 5,000 men left uh, uh, Fort uh, Carson, Colorado. Um, about the 1st of August of 1968. So shortly after Tet, at the very height of the fighting there. Yeah, we were uh, stationed at Quantry, 23 miles or 21 miles south of the DMZ. 
and um, so I Corps area. Yeah, I helped unload a lot of helicopters with the wounded troops on. Were you at the division headquarters? And hell, I don't remember where the division headquarters was. I was at Bingham Hill. I do know that um, our company uh, was strictly a medical company. We had some 280 personnel, six or eight doctors, a couple of psychs, a couple of dentists. Um, uh, all we did was uh, put band-aids on people and send them on to uh, other places. Mm -hmm. You said your specific duty was to unload helicopters that were yes. being medevaced in? Yep. yep. Uh, did they do any triage then? I did triage. You did triage. Um, yeah. Do you care to describe what that was like? Uh, it was not uh, pretty. It was um, uh, guys were shot in the, in, in, a, you know, in the jungle, and uh, uh, they're in shock. They've, they've had their morphine out in the field. They're, they're brought in, and uh, uh, we just made a quick once glance over to see where in the world they were, they were uh, where they were hit, you know, if they, they could... They would survive. Uh, they were given this, every opportunity, you know. If they weren't, they were put back on the back burner a little bit. Now, having to make decisions about triage, these are life and death decisions, I would think. It would essentially there was always a doctor there to overrule. But when a chopper came in, you said, "Hey, doc, this guy make a decision on this one." You know, he needs to be first. Yeah, he needs to be first. This guy's got a bullet hole through his ear. He's Oh, baby, let him sit in a tree a while, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, One day he had an extra arm. An extra arm? He had this um, gurney, uh, litter. It was taken off the helicopter. And, uh, the guy had a, a, a wounded leg, but uh, and he had a bleeding arm. But between his legs was laying an extra arm, and, I, and nobody came in missing an arm that morning. So hmm. you go figure. What was your uh, parents' reaction about you being in Nam? Uh, they were not happy campers about it, but uh, you know, uh, that was the only son that was over there. Brother Jerry, who got the draft notice the same uh, uh, same day between uh, August and December when I left, he had his name in for adoption through Catholic Charities, and they called, and here he had a baby boy. I didn't. So, so he didn't go? He didn't go. What was Kathy doing during that time? Kathy uh, came with me uh, to S San Antonio uh, to... Uh, um, for advanced training, and uh, I got to leave the base every night and go see her, but they wound up on base every night, sleeping on base. Now, uh, and then we finished there, and I got moved to Colorado, uh, Colorado Springs, Fort Carson, and she moved to Colorado with me. And then when I went to Vietnam, she came home. Uh, she stayed at her mom's a little while, and then she says, why am I doing this? I've got a house to live in. I'm going to move back here. So she moved back here. Who was taking care of the farm at the time? Uh, I rented a farm for my brother Phil. And we rented a house out to another couple, a young couple who just married. So. Mm -hmm. um, tough for her to be here kind of by herself while you're overseas and right. worry about you every day? Well, she didn't hear from me at all. Um, letters... I don't think she ever got a letter from me, but I wrote one every day, but they all came when I got home. Uh, so I was just there 28 days. Why such a short time? Uh, military intelligence. Uh, they're, they're really smart about things. They trained me to fight in the jungle. They trained me to be a medic. And when I got over there, I figured that was not a good place to be. It was hot. It was steamy. Uh, lots of bugs around, people were getting shot, not a healthy place to be. So I told my CO I was going to apply for an early out. There were a lot of guys getting out in September to go back to school, serve uh, 21, 22 months. And, you know, and I'd only had three months to serve yet, so, hey, I want to 
to all myself, you know, we need uh, food to keep this war going. We needed wheat, and I needed to get home and sow my wheat. And my CO looked at me and laughed. He says, no way in hell would the United States Army grant you an early out to go home and sow wheat. I said, well, I've got to have it sowed uh, right after the fly-free date, which is October. I've got to get my equipment all lined up, you know, my drill and so forth, and prepare my soil. And probably take me 30 days, but if I got out on September the 6th, that would be fine. It'd be 90 days early out. That'd be great. And so he says, you know, they need a good laugh to Pentagon. Why don't you just go ahead and fill out this request? <laughs> and sent it in. And so I did. And by golly, they approved it. And so I wasn't going to argue with them. Would you have been extended? Because you were well, even if you had served out your two-year tour, you're still well short of the one-year tour that most soldiers were serving in. Uh, because I didn't volunteer, and because it was a whole division that left, mm -hmm. there were guys in that division that had less time than I. I had 90 days from the time we got there. Actually, 120 days when I got there, the time I was supposed to get out. There were guys supposed to be there uh, uh, only 40 days, 60 days they were going to get out there. We would get out to October 1st, but they got sent anyway. Mm -hmm. So that's the way it was. They didn't extend those duties back then. Of uh, your experience in the military, you got out uh, a couple months early, but uh, looking back at it now, uh, what did you learn out of that? <clears throat> uh, great experience. I, I would think that uh, for most young men, uh, uh, basic training, AIT, working together, understanding, um, cooperating, and, and how our military works, I think it would be good experience for, for every man. It would be a, a, a good deal. Do you think it changed you at all, especially that short time that you're in Vietnam and doing what you were doing? Uh, hard question to answer. I don't know. I think it made me calloused a little bit once in a while. Uh, uh, maybe I'm cynical of government, uh, some of the stupid moves they make. But you know, government is a pro real problem, and and I didn't want to ever have anything to do with it again. You know, that's what you came out thinking. Mm -hmm. And before that time, you were probably the typical idealistic kid growing up in America about about that. No, I wasn't crazy about the uh, Vietnam War. I, I saw it as a, a no-win situation. I knew it was politically motivated before I ever left, and and but I wasn't going to go to Canada. I mean, I'm a better American then, and I was I would do what I had to do, and I did. Um, wasn't crazy about it, but if I were called, I'd, I'd do my duty. So. Okay. What I'd like to do now is to take a break, and we'll pick it up. And uh, the next session here, we're going to talk about um, farming as a young man and getting into politics as a young man. So I look forward to that, Chuck. Okay. <laughs>